This is the Tomahawk. Originally manufactured by General Dynamics and some other companies before going to RTX, it is a subsonic cruise missile used by the United States and Royal Navy, and soon the Netherlands, Australia, Japan, and Canada. It has been in service since 1981 and is mostly known for its land attack role, striking high value or heavily defended targets in enemy territory, such as aircraft bunkers, factories, soft vehicles, and entire military complexes and cities with its W-80 nuclear warhead. It is mainly launched from naval vessels, surface ships, and even submarines. There is a lot more to the Tomahawk than just point and shoot, however, and today on Scenario Fulfillment, you're going to learn a lot about the capabilities of this modular cruise missile. Like I said earlier, the Tomahawk is mainly launched from naval vessels, and you've probably seen footage of them being launched from their vertical launching tubes, but when the missile is being developed, the vertical launching system wasn't in service yet, so the Navy relied on the four-celled Mark 143 armored box launcher. And if you've seen the modernized decommissioned Iowa-class battleships, you've probably seen these giant boxes. Apart from surface ships, submarines too. They can be launched from torpedo tubes, but a more effective way would be from the vertical launching system of a submarine, instead of wasting precious torpedo space. Apart from naval ships, there are other means of launching this missile, but we'll go over those later. The Tomahawk has multiple variants and sub-variants, including an anti-ship variant. We'll go over that later, but for now, the missile is being propelled by a Williams F-107 turbofan engine. Now to kick these missiles out of their launching spaces, they are fitted with a solid rocket booster, and these boosters detach from the missile once expelled. The missile knows where it is because it relies on GPS, NINS, TURCOM, and DISMAC. That's a lot, so let's go over them. Except GPS, I hope you know what that is. First, INS, or Inertial Navigation System. Before there was GPS, there was INS. Essentially, you would enter your exact position on the planet into the missile. Then you would enter the target location. Then the missile would fly out to its target. But INS has a common problem, and it's called drift. Errors introduced into the system over time. This can happen mid-flight or even static on the ground. To help the INS out, there is TURCOM, or Terrain Contour Matching. To keep it short and sweet, the missile has a stored pre-planned route gathered from satellite or aircraft reconnaissance data, and this data has the terrain's elevation. While the missile is in flight, it will match the terrain below it with its radar altimeter to determine if it's on the right course. If it sees it's on the wrong course, it will correct itself. And this allows the missile to fly extremely low to the ground to avoid air defenses, and the missile can hit its target pretty accurately with TURCON. To help aid also is DISMAC, or Digital Scene Matching Area Correlation. Instead of radar, it uses stored images from satellite or aircraft reconnaissance data to match it with what it sees with its onboard camera. Think of Google Lens, where if you point it at an object, it will tell you what it is. And this is extremely impressive for 1980s technology. Yeah, this is not new. However, images taken from Recon would have to be made into binary images, like 1-bit JPEGs, to reduce load on the system. More than likely, with advancements in processors, this has improved. Because there's no terrain when flying over water, the missile has to rely on INS, but can also use GPS as well, even for extreme precision. But if the satellites go down, it can rely on TURCOM and DISMAC with hard drives of telemetry data and satellite imaging data in today's world. Now, TURCOM and DISMAC were not perfect. In 2003, during the invasion of Iraq, Tomahawk missiles drifted into Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and even Iran. This was because the desert terrain was not very suitable for these systems. The missile's payload varies from variant. It can carry a conventional unitary brooch warhead. Apart from that, it has a cluster munitions payload as well, consisting of 166 BLU-79B combined effects munitions. And a set amount can be dropped over a target, and then the missile can move over to another target and do the same thing. What happens to the missile after they're all gone, I have no idea. 
Before we continue, let's talk about the letter designations. You've commonly seen BGM-109. B means it is capable of being launched in more than one environment. G means it is a surface attack weapon, and M just means missile. Then there's RGM, UGM, and AGM. You know what G and M means already, but R means it's launched from a surface vessel, and U means it's launched from underwater. And A means air launched. And as a little extra, 109 means it is the 109th missile under the United States military's designation system. And that is a good segue to the other variants. Remember those other methods of launching the missile I was going to talk about? Well, there was going to be the AGM-109, launched from the B-52, but was cancelled. Also known as the MRASM, or Medium Range Air to Surface Missile, it was kind of like the Harpoon Land Attack Missile, the SLAM. It featured an infrared camera and data link to control the missile for more precision. Then there was the BGM-109G, a ground-launched cruise missile with a W-84 thermonuclear warhead. They were going to launch these from a four-cell launcher trailer, and their deployment in Europe during the Cold War caused a lot of controversy, as with a lot of things in nuclear. But don't worry, because they were put out of service in 1991. These cool-looking bunkers they restored in are still around, though. The TASM, or Tomahawk Anti-Ship Missile, was special, and it's making a comeback. It acts like a normal anti-ship missile. It can do normal pop-up attacks, and it can act on its own. But it is a lot bigger than a harpoon missile, and stands out on radar. Not much is known about it detail-wise, but it did have more range than a harpoon. And this gave it the ability to loiter around an area and wait for a would-be Soviet ship to appear on its seeker. Of course, you would need to be careful with this, because other maritime traffic exists as well. The first combat use of the Tomahawk missile was on January 17, 1991, in Operation Desert Storm, with the USS San Jacinto and the Bunker Hill, both Ticonderoga-class cruisers, firing the first Tomahawks in combat history. On Day 3, the USS Louisville and USS Pittsburgh, both Los Angeles-class attack submarines, fired the first submarine-launched Tomahawks in combat history, and the missile saw great success in destroying many targets in Iraq. In today's Tomahawk arsenal exists the new Block 5 variant. It can loiter around a target like a drone and receive mission updates via data link, giving it the ability to be retargetable, basically a kamikaze drone. Then there's the Block 5A, a maritime strike variant with shorter range but much more improved sensors. It can hit ships on its own or be guided in via data link. This can be done from naval vessels or aircraft with the capability to do so. The United States Marines are giving the Block 5s a shot with their long-range fires launcher. From Sandbox.us author Alex Hollings, The LRFL is an uncrewed tactical vehicle that carries a single Tomahawk cruise missile, allowing Marines to engage targets at ranges of hundreds of miles or more. Importantly, the platform itself is designed to support rapid deployment in austere environments, allowing the marines to quickly take islands and begin wreaking havoc on any enemy vessel or positions within reach. The United States Army is also testing Tomahawks with land batteries as well with their mid-range capability weapon system. And with these new launch platforms, it will bring a lot of lethality to the United States military and potential allies and buyers. 